Hi everyone, welcome to How to Support Your Ministries, Faithful Giving and Stewardship, presented by the United Church of Canada Foundation. My name is Jessica Smith, and I'm here with my colleague, Reverend Melody Duncanson-Hales. And so thank you for being with us. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, we put this webinar together so that folks could learn about the different ways of giving to and through the foundation, um, and also to learn from our colleagues engaged in congregational stewardship and mission and service work, and a little bit about um, kind of the theory behind giving um, so that you can be inspired to give and also help inspire others to make gifts. Um, and we'll also do that by hearing um, testimonial from one of our donors. So it is a little bit of a mixed bag, um, what we're going to be discussing today, and we do have a mixed group here as well. Um, but I think whether you are um, uh, a minister or other church leadership, um, a volunteer in your community of faith or your organization, uh, like on the stewardship committee or treasurer in fundraising, whether you're staff at your organization, um, or whether you're a donor to the foundation or you use the foundation to make um, other other don donations to other organizations, or whether you consider yourself more um, a mission and service donor, or um, if you give locally, I think there's going to be something for everyone, and and everyone will be able to come away having learned something, um, and and um, I think you'll find it very useful. Um. So to introduce myself, I'm Jessica Smith. As I said, I'm the Foundation Communication and Campaign Associate. Um, I've been with the United Church for just over 10 years now um, in a variety of roles in the philanthropy unit and then in the foundation. Um, plan giving um, is mostly my portfolio, so I'm going to touch a little bit on that. And that is, that's my background. Um, Melody, if you want to quickly introduce yourself as well. Sure. As Jess mentioned, I, um, I'm clergy and I work with the philanthropy unit in supporting congregations, communities of faith, different ministries. And I'm situated, I'm joining you from Sudbury, Ontario today, where I serve Canadian Shield Regional Council and Shining Waters Regional Council uh, uh, communities of faith in that capacity. Great. So that's us. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to acknowledge that the Foundation's offices are located in Toronto, and I'm nearby working from home in Mississauga, um, and it's on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're all joining from um, different places across the country. Different Indigenous people have lived on all of the land that we're living on and entered into relationships and took care of that land. Um, so as always, I encourage each of you to think about how you're going to engage with the knowledge that we're all in relationship together, um, coming together here today, and settler folk have work to do as we reconcile and live in right relationship with the Indigenous people whose territories we live, work, and play upon. Right, so here is our agenda for this afternoon. I'll give a brief intro um, to the work and the services of the foundation and a little bit about us as an organization. Um, Melody will speak about engaging your community of faith in stewardship work. Um, I'll talk about plan giving. I'm going to try not to go too technical um, into all of the different ways that you can make a plan gift, um, but we will provide you with resources um, so that you can get all of that information. And I'll also talk about um, ways of giving to and through the foundation. Um, then we will be joined. We're so glad that she's here today. Uh, we're joined by a, a longtime friend and donor um, to the foundation uh, who's here to share her story with us today. And then hopefully we will have some time for questions and answers at the end. If you do have questions throughout, please pop them into the chat. Um, <coughs> my colleague Ashley is here to facilitate the questions. Um, so she'll compile them all so that we can get to as many as we can at the end before we close off. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So the United Church of Canada Foundation is, you may or may not know, a separate organization from the United Church of Canada. It was established uh, in 2002 by the General Council Executive at the time to uh, manage the endowments and trusts of the United Church of Canada. 
which is still a large part of, of what we do. But over the past 21 years, we've grown and our services ex have expanded um, to the point that we now have our own um, strategic plan. And we have uh, named four organizational priorities that uh, inform the decisions we make and guide the work that we do. And you'll see on the screen there, we have um, a purpose statement. And you'll, you can, you'll probably notice that um, the words, the echo or mirror those of the United Church of Canada, foster deep spirituality, bold discipleship and daring justice by attracting and deploying financial resources through capacity building, convening, granting, and careful stewardship of the funds entrusted to us. We support congregations, ministries, and programs that enrich the United Church of Canada, create a more just planet, and celebrate God's abundance in the world. So what does that mean distilled down? Essentially, there are um, three branches of, of services that we can provide. Um, investing, grants, and ways to give. Um, so in following the words of the new creed, the foundation strives to be faithful stewards of the generosity of our congregations. Um, and that means more than ensuring financial returns. It's about caring for creation and all of our relationships. So the foundation, um, along with the treasury fund of the general council and the pension plan of the church, <coughs> excuse me, have developed a set of um, environmental, social and governance criteria, ESG criteria that help guide our investments. Um, and our, our, our investments are, are managed in bulk by um, Fiera Capital, you know, traditional portfolio comprised of stocks, fixed income investments, and a small cash component. Um, but a few years ago now, um, we took some of our assets and brought them to Genesis Capital Management um, to uh, have them manage a portion of our assets in what are called impact investments. Um, this portfolio um, complements our granting program than the other work that we're doing um, because it's focusing on making investments to support Indigenous businesses and projects, environmental um, and green focused business, um, initiatives that work towards economic justice for uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, underserved communities, newcomer communities. <clears throat> so our, our the dollars, the, the assets under management are out there doing good work um, as, they're, as they're growing. So they're doing good work while they're growing. The growth comes back to us, the, the um, income comes back and we grant it back out um, to do more good work. Um, we also um, have sort of a partnership investment program wherein uh, congregations and, and organizations can um, invest their assets with one of the investment firms that we have a relationship with, take advantage of that relationship that we have with them um, to, to invest separately from the foundation, but trusting that it's um, been, been vetted and it's um, within United Church of Canada ethos and values. Um, so those two partners are Genesis Capital Management, who does our impact investments, and also Frontier Capital Funds. Um, for our granting program, we offer a wide variety of grant opportunities for organizations um, to bring life to the mission and values of the United Church. Um, our Seeds of Hope granting program is the main granting program um, to support innovative, unique, much needed projects. Um, um, and we we have two granting rounds um, each year, one in spring, one in fall, and we grant over a million dollars um, each year to many exciting projects across our church. Um, uh, we've also dipped our toe into uh, trust-based granting and um, to granting to organizations which are not yet registered charities. Um, uh, we also have various academic award opportunities, scholarships, bursaries um, for United Church of Canada ministers, ministry students, and lay people. Lots of exciting opportunity there. Um, and we offer the scholarship opportun opportunities uh, once a year in the spring. And there are a few that are on a bit of a different schedule um, as well. 
Um, but for the purposes of this webinar, uh, we're going to talk mostly about ways to give. The foundation has a number of different ways that you can support United Church Ministry, um, both now in the present and also for the long term into the future. Um, so we will discuss some of those later um, in the presentation. But now I'm going to pass over to um, Melody, and she's going to talk to you about engaging your community of faith in stewardship work. And thanks so much, Jess. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for the time to be here. Um, thanks so much, Jess. Uh, and uh, just just a note that that much of the, the pieces that I'm covering this afternoon um, uh, and this morning are in our session today are actually rooted in our getting started in stewardship program that's offered on ChurchX for congregational team leaders, groups of people, anybody who's interested in just um, getting their their toes wet in in stewardship conversations in their in their community of faith. So I'd like to start by looking at motivations around why people give. Uh, there's a wonderful book uh, called, uh, written by Jake Cl uh, Chris Cliff, Christop no, Christopher Cliff, uh, who is, um, was written a book called Not Your Parents Offering Plate, which we really highly recommend if you're interested in any of this topic. We just wanna make sure that you understand that, um, that that there are so many ways that people give and, and so many different recipients, um, so many different opportunities, so many ways to make a difference in, um, in our larger community. We have so many different options. And so it's really important for us to understand motivation about why people give so that we understand how we communicate, how we care, and, and how we connect with those generous people in our communities of faith and how they support us. So the first reason why people give is because they believe in your purpose. They want to achieve the same outcomes and goals uh, to make the same changes in, in people, in societies, the way that you do. In church, that we would use the word uh, purpose, sharing a sim similar calling. So we ask folks to explore what is your calling as a community of faith? How do you communicate that? How do you engage people in that calling? A second reason why people give is because they have a high regard for leadership, leadership that knows where you're heading, leadership that understands how to achieve that, that purpose and that calling that can communicate an exciting, inspiring vision. Now, we have to say, folks, we're not perfect, um, that we, we try our best, but that we communicate regularly and that we instill that trust. Um, all above all, be clear, be enthusiastic, and, and have a plan. A third reason why people give is because they believe that you are fiscally responsible, that you will use their money and time responsibly towards achieving uh, the same purpose and calling. People give because they believe their gifts will make a difference, that they, they have, it again, connecting with that purpose, having trust in the leadership, and that there is a respect for how their gifts are used. I'm moving to the next slide here. So when we are talking about stewardship, we're not just talking about fundraising, although that may have a role in your stewardship plans, but ultimately as a, as a community of faith, we are about helping people to grow in their spiritual life, grow closer to God, grow, follow the way of Jesus. And so stewardship as a discipleship response is something that we do regularly. When we delegate it to a few weeks in the fall or in the spring or just to one Sunday, what we're actually, actually doing is we're accidentally teaching people that stewardship, generosity, is sort of a necessary evil that we have to talk about when it's only time to pay bills. We're not teaching people that it's about our spiritual growth. It's about how we grow as, as generous and grateful people of God. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at stewardship, we're looking at a holistic understanding of stewardship, that we have a whole year to help our, you know, our whole community understand that giving connects people to people. It develops our relationships. Generosity sets us free from consumerism and greed. 
Um, and it, it allows us to be transformed. Giving brings joy and hope and giving and receiving that kind of connection. It feels good, it's healthy for us. Generosity is a key spiritual practice for followers of Jesus. We know that Jesus talked a lot about generosity and giving, and so it's not optional really for disciples. And just like other key spiritual practices we offer together, that we share in together, like prayer, like worship, like study, we have the honor and the privilege and the responsibility of attending to this aspect of our shared discipleship and, and allowing this richness to transform our communities. So what are the ways that people have to give? We know that if, um, if presented, if, if people have choice, if there are ways that, you know, different ways that people have of giving, of participating in their community, and particularly financially, um, that that they're that generous people are generous, that they're able to respond to those invitations. So I've got a list up here on this slide. Take a look at it and see if your community of faith allows for these sorts of opportunities to give. And maybe not just once a year or once a month or any of these things, but but presents them and invites folks to participate in these regularly. If they see something on the screen that you say, hey, I haven't tried that out yet, or hey, I'd like to have some more information, um, definitely come contact your stewardship support staff person in your region. We can help you add in just one more practice, one more opportunity for people to give um, in your community of faith. There's lots and lots of ways. And, and as we learned over the pandemic, many communities of faith that had a multiple um, multiple opportunities to give saw, saw themselves through in, in different ways than others. So to increase generosity, and this is the, the, the three key foundational ideas that, that we go back to again and again within our stewardship development work. There is no secret sauce. There is no magic wand. I wish they had given one to me at my ordination. I would have been lovely in some fairy wings and, and with a beautiful magic wand where I could make this all easy. But it does require attention. It, it requires focus. It requires intentionality. But we can increase. We can um, connect. We can grow with people. And this is all about culture change for many of us. We are looking to help people form as disciples. And so these are not quick fixes. These are intentional, regular ways to develop. The first one you see on your screen is around inspiration, remembering why people give, remembering what motivates people to give. And on that list that I shared earlier, um, the word guilt wasn't there, the word obligation wasn't there, the word duty or threats or fear. That's not why people give. People give to be aligned with your purpose and calling. So that key piece around inspiration and communicating that inspiration regularly is really important. Tell the stories, invite other people to tell their stories, use different ways of communicating, use pictures, use video, think broadly, think creatively, all the ways that you can be, share your excitement of your purpose and your calling in, in your community today. And the goal of that is so that when you approach someone and invite them to be part of it, they ask you how they can be part of it. They, they are so enthusiastic, they're so inspired by your story that they want to be part of it. Which leads us to that second part. The second key foundational um, idea is, inspir is invitation. I'm just trying to click to make sure it comes up there. And maybe Jess, you have to click. Um, is it coming up? There it is, invite. We have to ask. I've met with a, a number of congregations over the years, and I remember one person in particular who uh, is an admissions minister, comes to us from a, from a different culture. Uh, have, I have a lot to learn. And he said, you know, in my home community, we have a phrase, closed mouths don't get fed. So we can't expect people to make connections on their own. What do we need to 
to have? What, what are the things that we need in order to fulfill our purpose and our calling? We can be specific. We can make direct invitations. We can ask people to help us in that, in, in, in that purpose and in that calling. And once we've invited, we need to take a moment and allow people to discern and respond. Sometimes we hear no, and that's okay. And sometimes that means a no, not right now, or no, not in this way. So allow people to respond and say how they want to participate. Maybe it's with time. Maybe it's with prayer life to, to surround that particular purpose and calling. Invite people to consider how they want to be respond. And when they say yes, you move on to that other key foundational idea, which is to say thank you. Whoops, can you move back a minute? Back, Jessica? To say thank you, there we go. We can't say thank you too much. It is the easiest thing to do. And sometimes the thing that we forget most, right? We want to see people, we want to attend to them, we want to be intentional about caring for them. And so we wanna say thank you. Personal, timely, sincere. Maybe you can write a handwritten note or a phone call or an email. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It goes so far in connecting, in building relationship, in allowing people to, to develop that culture of gratitude and generosity. It is a wonderful place to start. And um, it's just a, a really easy way to, to connect. Remember, we're not just talking about giving and generosity in our local communities of faith. All of these key foundations allow us to go beyond the doors, to, to have impact in our wider community, to have impact in our country and around the world through mission and service um, and through the United Church Foundation. So I just want to highlight some of the key ways that you can get engaged with these ideas and bring them back to your uh, community of faith. We have four course offerings that are available to you on the Church X platform. And the first I mentioned, the easiest way to engage is, is just getting started in stewardship, which is a one, uh, one and a half hour webinar. We offer that this um, quite regularly throughout the year. Uh, the next intake, we just finished one uh, last week, and we will be running that, that webinar again February the 12th. Um, we offer two times so that people across the country can, can um, log on on a time that is most convenient for you. We also um, engage people through Stewardship Best Practices, which is quite an intensive course for, for congregational teams that are ready to really build a strategic plan, uh, a year-round strategic plan for their congregation around stewardship principles um, to, you know, to move forward on that uh, inspire, invite, and thank in their, in their communities of faith. Jess is a great leader, and she's she's part of the bequest and estate giving uh, webinars that we offer. Um, these are these are two sessions only, uh, but it comes with some homework, some ways that you can engage your community of faith further in alternative ways of of giving um, that don't come from that regular um, income stream, but come from planned gifts, comes from savings. And finally, you can work with my colleague, Brenna Baker, uh, in setting up your giving program. If that is something that, that you need to spend some intentional time doing throughout the year where you have um, some, some very uh, focused time to intentionally um, invite people to discern their giving regularly uh, for your community of faith. And I think that's pretty much where we're at. Thank you so much. And thanks, um, Ashley, for making sure people know in the, in, the, um, in, in the chat that all of these programs are available on the Church X platform. Okay. Every time I try and unmute myself, I'm advancing the slide. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Melody. So I'm going to talk a bit about first giving to and through the foundation, and then I'm going to talk about plan giving. And I think you'll see that a lot of the things that Melody said um, are going to be echoed in the slides that I'm going to present. Um, and of course, that's by design because um, the foundation is a way that you can um, 
giving through or to the foundation is a way that you can um, support your ministry. It's not separate um, in in that way. It is a separate or organization, but there are tools that the foundation has that you can um, support the ministry you love. And plan giving, as Melody mentioned, is not something that should happen once a year or once every couple of years or only happen on, on a specific night um, that not everybody can get to. It's something that needs to be built into your whole stewardship um, program um, and the life of, of your um, congregation and your community of faith. So, um, yes, a lot of the themes are going to be echoed through these um, and um, it's just going to drive the point home. And I think you'll see what the picture becomes a lot clearer. Giving to and through the foundation. Now, as the foundation's grown, uh, we've been able to take a broader look at the kinds of relationships and collaborations that are necessary um, to create a space where we are providing leadership and valuable services to the church and the community. Uh, we look at building relationships, not just with individuals, although that is a big focus, um, but also um, continually strengthening our relationships with communities of faith. If you recall back to the slide about the, the services of the foundation, communities of faith, support for communities of faith is one of our priorities. So that um, includes congregations, regional councils, the general council office, um, other United Church ministries like um, chaplaincies and um, outdoor education centers, schools, camps, <clears throat> um, as well as with uh, other organizations and foundations that share our values and our goals. We're also beginning to look for voices that are not and traditionally have not uh, been involved with the foundation and to seek to understand why that is um, and what we could do differently to be more welcoming and uh, more inclusive. And for the purposes of this webinar, that may include um, expanding the ways that people can give to the foundation or become involved with the foundation to support ministry that they love. Um, um, increasing the number of ways or learning about new ways of giving that are um, that have traditionally maybe not been associated with um, foundations and long term giving. Um, um, because we, we've long said that the foundation's focus is on the long term on the future. But the reality is, um, we're at a crossroads in the world. This is a decade where we need to make strides to mitigate climate change. Um, uh, <laughs> this is a decade where there's momentum and visibility um, and opportunity to bring so many along on our journey or to catch up with folks who are, are further along the path on their own journey uh, to become anti-racist and to move forward in our efforts to reconcile uh, with Indigenous people across the country. Um, and and we use these these priorities to um, in, inform our work and to provide uh, meaningful ways for people to give um, to the to the ministry of the church and to the foundation. Um, so uh, folks can donate to any fund that the foundation holds, whether that's a fund that we that grants through our Seeds of Hope. Uh, granting program, or whether it's um, a fund that was set up privately by a an individual or a family um, um, uh, to, to support one or more ministries, uh, the congregation, or uh, a specific type of, uh, a specific um, uh, purpose um, that was that was important to them or um, whether it's to a fund that a congregation set up to provide uh, sustainable um, income to them on an annual basis. Um, you can donate to any fund that the foundation holds and all gifts from individuals or businesses are eligible for a char charitable tax receipt. And people can donate to any of these funds um, in much of the same way um, as Melody named in her uh, uh, earlier in her part, but uh, you can give online, which has obviously exploded in the, in the past uh, five or so years. Um, donations to the, the foundation online are made through the Canada Helps platform, including monthly gifts. But you can also give directly um, with a credit card or cutting a check. Um, there's also opportunity to give to the foundation um, 
on a regular basis through PAR. Um, and um, another popular option is gifts of securities, um, stocks, mutual funds. Now, right now, 2023, um, the, the rules will change a little bit next year um, and going forward. But right now, the government does not collect capital gains taxes on securities that have been donated to charity, um, like the foundation. Um, so all donors will be paying is a 1.5% fee up to $250 um, um, on the value of the, the donated securities. Um, and they will receive a uh, charitable tax receipt for the full value of the shares that are transferred. And people can use these securities, direct the, the proceeds of the sale of the securities to any foundation fund um, or establish a new fund, or <coughs> they can direct the securities immediately to their own congregation or United Church camp, um, a theological school, um, any United Church ministry, or directly to the United Church of Canada, including for mission and service, gifts with vision, emergency appeals. Um, <coughs> and there's also the option to, to take advantage of our gift fund program, which is what we call uh, when folks make gifts of securities. You can use gift funds to um, uh, send out gifts to charities whose mission, any Canadian charity whose mission and goals do not conflict, conflict with um, those of the United Church of Canada. Um, so it's a great way to streamline um, not only your local giving and your giving permission and service, but also to support the ministry of the um, ministry supported by the foundation. And also, you know, if, if there are two or three other charities that you regularly give to, it might make sense to do it all one at once through the foundation. Um, so those which I've just named are, are gifts that are, they're not necessarily all uh, in the present, but they're mostly gifts that are, are sent out right away. But there's also the opportunity for individuals and families and organizations um, to uh, invest with the foundation through the creation of long-term funds, um, which will uh, provide lasting resources to support the ministries um, into the future. So um, long-term funds will include um, endowment funds where the principal is held in perpetuity and will continue to grant the income each year um, um, to the, the ministry or ministries of your choice. Um, and also non-endowed funds, uh, trust funds essentially, which will eventually draw down to zero each year, granting a little, a little bit um, of the principal until it eventually reaches a balance of zero. <clears throat> Folks can create these um, funds by uh, um, creating a planned gift, making a gift now, writing a check, making a gift online, a gift of securities, or you can also use um, a bequest in your will, a gift in your will, or um, some other type of legacy gift, or um, offering it as an opportunity for folks to memorialize you at your death. Um, there are a number of ways to establish a fund. It can be started with um, nothing, just an agreement, um, but they must um, achieve a balance of $15,000 to begin making grants. Um, and they can grant to any registered Canadian charity as long as 50% of the, the um, funds go to a United Church of Canada beneficiary. So again, just like I was saying with gift funds, it's a good, it's a way for folks to maybe streamline their giving um, into the future. Um, but depending on the kind of fund you set up, um, it may make sense for you to use this as for your giving um, now, but it's also a way for folks to continue to provide support to the ministry and the organizations, the causes that are close to them, that provided them life during their life, their lives, um, after they're gone. Um, um, the um, long-term funds have an annual administration fee of uh, one to one and a half percent, depending on the balance of your fund. And um, the terms are really flexible. We work with you to make something that makes sense for the way that you want to give. So that is that. So types of plan gifts, I'm going to talk about all the, the different types of plan gifts. But first, so what is plan gift? 
um, a plan gift is a gift from your estate or savings, not your income. The vast majority of plan gifts are future or deferred gifts. Um, uh, as I mentioned, endowment and long-term funds are something that um, people use uh, while they're living, as well as the last one on the list, which I already spoke about, um, gifts of securities. The others are gifts that you make, uh, that you that you set up during your life, but they're um, activated um, upon your death. A plan gift is a testament um, of your faith and your belief in generosity and taking care of others. And they they fund um, your community of faith or, or whatever organization's ongoing ministries. Um, they facilitate the creation of new ministry programs and opportunities and help sustain your community of faith through times of transition. Um, um, Melody touched on, on the reasons why people give, um, and they are quite the same uh, for planned gifts. And I would say churches have a bit of a leg up over other charities because the number one um, reason that people give is because they are aligned with your calling and your purpose. So, you know, if they're in the pews, if they're joining you on Zoom, if they're coming out to your events, um, um, if they're already donating in different ways, they're showing you that they have something in common with with the ministry of your community of faith or your organization, um, which leads to uh, the second reason why people give. They have a relationship with your community of faith and with the leadership. Uh, while it's true that folks give because they're aligned with your ministry, it's also important to nurture and grow your relationship with them um, for many reasons, of course. Um, but one of the reasons is that folks give more generously when there's an established relationship. Um, and this is also why it's important to have leadership on board with the stewardship programming in your congregation. Uh, folks want to see a total buy-in. Um, if, you're, if you're a donor on this call um, and, and not in church leadership or, or on the stewardship team or, or what have you, you're probably you 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 understand that you want to see that top down. Um, every, everybody believes in the whole stewardship program and that um, a plan gifts are part of it, <clears throat> um, because that that links to the final point. Folks give because they trust that you're going to use their gift well and that your ministry is sustainable. That you're not just using their gift to keep your doors open for one more funeral or that you're going to receive the gift and it's just going to uh, squirm around for 20 years because there's no plan in place um, to use it to, or to use it well, that's gonna be squandered on something that they um, didn't, um, wasn't important to, to their, their life of faith. <clears throat> um, the number one reason why people do not make a plan gift uh, folks might think it's because um, uh, that people can't afford it. But no, the number one reason they don't make a gift is because they're not asked. So this is why it's important to con consider uh, plan giving as part of your entire stewardship programming. It has to be something that you're talking about regularly. It has to be something that there's a plan for. There has to be something that inspires trust in folks. Um, and one of the most powerful motivators for making a plan gift is seeing the impact of bequests and, and other plan gifts on your church and community and on the lives of those who've benefited from the plan gifts and benefited from the continued ministry um, of your of your community of faith. Um, um, it, people give to the church because they believe that their gifts are going to make a real long term difference for the ministry that they love. Um, and people are mo even more motivated to give if they know their gifts are going to be well managed. So taking the time to implement a plan giving program in your community of faith will help folks see how their legacy can make an impact. And then once they're, you ha collect the stories of, of those who can tell the stories. And that is absolutely the number one thing that is going to inspire the trust. Seeing that it's already, that it's, the the work the plans are already laid everybody has total buy-in and that it's making an impact it's making a gift and people can say hey i can do that too um because pl 
Plan gifts can be truly transformational, but the best church plan giving programs don't stand alone. You have to view plan giving as one part or one stream of your congregation's overall revenue generation and stewardship program. And that's not to say that you have to be an expert um, in, in the ways of plan giving, but at minimum, there should be a plan gifts program in place at your congregation or your organization. And Melody um, mentioned earlier, um, that module three, as, as we call it colloquially, bequest and estate giving, called to be the church, the journey, bequest and estate giving module. That is, is what you want to be a part of um, when we run it again in the springtime. That is what's going to set you up with all of the tools that you need, all of the policies, um, all of the motions, all of the, um, the ideas and promotional materials and marketing and the, the, the ways that you're going to get total buy-in from the, the leadership all the way down to everybody in the pews to feel that they have, um, um, that they've had a hand in, um, creating this and that it's a part of the life of your community of faith. So, um, if you have questions about that module, um, getting signed up for that module, um, speak to us so we can get you on the list for the next time that we're running it. It was very popular this fall and um, what a blessing. We've always, we've already been able to see some folks um, putting the plans into action. So that knowing that these are the tools that are going to make a difference, you're going to want to get in, you're going to want to get in on that. So that said, let's talk about the types of plan gifts that are available. And like I said, you don't need to be an expert on all of these and the module three program will give you um, some more tools to be able to speak about them confidently. But sometimes the, the way that you're going to speak about them confidently is that you know who to ask, that you know who to point somebody to who's going to have the answers. And maybe that person's me or Melody or one of our colleagues. Um, but um, th these are the types of plan gifts um, that are available to support your ministry and, and, and the wider ministry, the ministries of the wider church and the foundation. So the number one gift um, makes up 90% of, of planned gifts is a gift in your will bequest. Um, willpower.ca is a wonderful organization, a new organization just in the past couple of years, which is um, was put together to inspire Canadians to put a planned gift in their will um, to charity. Um, <coughs> and uh, sort of dispelling some of the myths of of putting a plan gift in your will and um giving you talking points for speaking with your advisor and, and your tax professional uh, folks and with your family about your wishes and helping you um make informed decisions about what you should do so uh willpower.ca again I'll, I'll mention it again and ashley will put it in the chat but um a gift in your will is super easy if you don't have a will um our will workbook resource is a, is an awesome place to start. It helps you think through all of the different aspects of your will, um, including making a planned gift, but also from from scratch. Um, and if you do already have a will, it, it may be um, as easy as um, adding a line uh, to to make a planned gift. Um, we in in the will workbook there is specific uh, verbiage that you can give to your lawyer to add to your will. It's called codicil when you when you add to it, but um, the specific wording is in there. Also, if you need help with it, please uh, send me an email um, or get in touch by phone and we can talk um, about what you what you need to, to uh, speak to your lawyer about, about adding a plan gift for your congregation or other United Church ministry or um, making a plan gift to the foundation to uh, set up an endowment fund. <clears throat> Charitable gift annuities are something that the United Church has offered for years. Um, I actually sit on the board of the uh, Canadian Charitable uh, Annuities Association. Um, we're long-term members of that. It's, it's a way that folks can make a gift now. They receive a tax receipt for a portion of that amount. And then the church uh, pays back to them on a semi-annual basis, um, a small payment, guaranteed income for life until their death, whatever is left um, of their original gift, um, plus whatever it has earned in investment, minus what they've taken over the years, that will go to the ministry or ministries of their choice, United Church Ministry of their choice. 
<laughs> if you'd like to learn more about charitable gift annuities or um, um, get some literature to speak about them or to get quotes, I am the contact for that. Um, and I'll be, I'd be happy to speak with you about it. Or if you want to direct folks to me, that's wonderful. Um, personal endowments and long-term funds. I spoke about them on the previous slide, but like I said, you can use gifts, these other gifts, a gift of life insurance can be used to establish, um, an endowment fund. The proceeds of your annuity, uh, the residual of your annuity can be used to establish an endowment fund. A gift of securities can be used to establish an endowment fund. And then your legacy is, is the ministry that your endowment fund is, is funding year after year after year after year. Um, gift of life insurance. Uh, it, there's a couple ways that you can do this. If you have an existing policy, you can gift it to the United Church of Canada and you'll receive a tax receipt um, for the value of it. Um, and it's as simple as that. You designate, it, it could go to your congregation, it could go to mission and service. Um, it's, it's super simple and pro it probably best done through uh, the general counsel office where again, I would be your contact for that. But you can also, if you have a policy that you're still paying premiums on, you can transfer the policy to the foundation or the United Church of Canada, put the policy in our name, continue to pay the premiums, and <coughs> every year you receive a tax receipt for the value of the premiums that you pay. Um, it can be a way that for a smaller outlay of cash, <coughs> excuse me, you're making a gift, the death benefit may be, Ta 10 times the gift that you can make um, at one time during your lifetime. And it, it's a truly transformational gift that could only be made in this specific way. So um, number one, speak with your fa financial advisor and see if that's that makes sense for you, a gift of life insurance, um, to donate an existing gift of life insurance, I should say, um, because it can be a, 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 a very creative way to make a gift. To the to support the, the ministry that you love the the other um um way that you can use a gift uh use a life insurance policy to make a gift is to name your church or other ministry as the beneficiary um, um upon your death you would your estate or your um the beneficiary would go through the process of um cashing the policy in and getting the death benefit. And then you would receive um, a, a charitable, your estate would receive a, a charitable receipt for that value. Um, the, uh, donating registered <coughs> investments like RIFs, RSPs, TFSAs um, is a, uh, uh, a, maybe a lesser known gift way of giving. Um, and one that you, you will again, want to determine if it's the right way for you to go. You can name, um, um, an organization, a charity as, as their beneficiary of, of any of these policies, um, through your will, in which case it's, it's an estate gift. Um, and it is a little more complicated, or you can go directly through your financial institution where you have this investment and um, change the beneficiary information there. And in that case, it's completely outside of your estate um, and it, it expedites the gift on your death. It goes immediately, um, I say immediately, but as immediately as possible um, to the beneficiaries that you name. Um, if you wanna know more about the specifics of um, how to do that or um, the tax implications of, of any of those, um, I'd be happy to speak with you about that, um, or um, please do speak with a tax professional or your financial advisor um, to make sure that you're choosing the right option. Um, or if, if you're informing folks about this being a way that they can make a gift to support um, ministry, um, to make sure that you're you're stressing that they need to speak with a with a professional to ensure that this is um, a way of giving that makes sense for them. Um, and gifts of securities, as I said, gifts of securities can be used to uh, make a gift in your will, can be used to purchase a, a charitable gift annuity, or to um, 
um, establish an endowment fund or add funds to an endowment fund, an existing fund, um, or to make a gift now to support current ministry. Again, you can make a gift of securities now. The turnaround is about three weeks from the, the day that you um, initiate the transfer with your broker um, all the way to us receiving uh, the gift, um, selling the shares, receiving the proceeds, um, and turning it around and sending it back out to the, the ministry that you've designated. It's about three weeks. Um, so if you're doing it to fulfill, you can do it to fulfill your, your annual pledge, um, your mission and service um, giving, or however you want to use that. Um, like I said, the rules for um, taxation of gifts of securities and, and other um, large gifts are changing in um, 2024. So if you want the specifics on that, um, please do make sure that you're, you're speaking with your financial advisor to, to select the right kind of giving that makes sense for your um, tax situation. But gifts of securities certainly in 2023 can be a very uh, um, tax smart way to make a gift. Um, uh, we do have a number of resources that you can use um, to promote gifts of securities to your organization. If you use social media, if you have bulletins or e-newsletters or physical newsletters, um, we have some plug and play things that you can plop right into those um, so that they know that making a gift of securities through the foundation can greatly benefit uh, the future of your ministry, current and future uh, ministry at your community of faith or organization. Um, so go to the foundation's website, United Church foundation.ca um, and search for those resources um, um, and, and, and use them um, to inspire gifts of uh, securities. Now, we, we process hundreds of these gifts of securities um, each year. Chances are um, you know somebody who's made one if you're not somebody yourself. Um, like I said in the... Um, uh, when I was talking about why people give one of the powerful motivators for making a planned gift, including gifts of securities, which is not a, gift, a future gift, but a, a present gift is to see the impact of those, that gift on your church and community, hearing from people who've done it, hearing from people who've benefited from it. So if you know somebody, or if you are somebody who has made a gift of securities and can speak to it, um, please certainly do that to promote that type of giving. Um, as it makes sense for you and and the, the ministry that you love, because it, uh, like I said, it's a it's a very powerful motivator. Uh, so, like stewardship in general, plan giving will be far more effective if people are informed, inspired, and asked multiple times a year. It's not going to be effective to have one seminar um, a year. Uh, we know that's a starting place and not an, not an ending. Uh, people need to learn about and be inspired by playing gifts and their legacy more than once. Um, so I encourage you uh, to, to uh, think of this as a program where, rather than a single initiative. If this is something that's new to you, consider can you find four different times over the next 12 months to promote legacy giving? Um, do, do you have a Facebook page? for your church that you can add it in? Can you put it in your bulletin or your, your e-newsletter um, so that it's top of mind um, and it's not something that just comes out of left field when people hear about it and they say, oh, I can't make it to that, that presentation on that night. I know I have to wait a whole other year to learn about what that is. So can you find four different times in the next 12 months to promote legacy giving? Um, and remember, it's for everyone. Talk about legacy giving um, to everyone at every stage of life. It's not just for people who are over 75. Um, young people, younger people um, are being encouraged now through many different mediums to um, take control of their legacy and um, create their will with um making space for um, giving in their will and not just protecting their own their own assets um, for their family or for whatever their own cause is. Um, so talk about it with everybody and, and keep the conversation going. 
talk about it through different mediums. As I said, put it in your bulletin, put it, have it in your announcements, um, have a worship service around it. If you can lead by example and talk about a plain gift that you have made, uh, whether you're a leader or not, a considered a leader or not, you can be a leader in this way. Um, if you have made a gift or you're if you're thinking about making a gift, you can share that with people in your community of faith um, and let them know that that's what you're thinking about or, or here's what I've done and here's how I did it. Um, and uh, if you have made a gift or if you've been touched by a gift before, you can play an important role um, in offering gratitude for gifts that have been made. Um, if, if somebody indicates that they are, uh, they've made a gift, um, the minister or other leaders in your church, you can reach out to that donor and say, thank you. Um, how can we, can we talk about this? Can we talk about this more widely to inspire others to do what you've done? So I've talked about a couple of resources that you may find helpful and I've, I've compiled them all here. Ash is going to pop the links for them in the chat. Um, I talked about willpower, which is the organization that is, um, promoting giving to charity through a gift in your will, through a bequest. Um, you can go to willpower.ca. The foundation has a special page on there. Um, your community of faith or organization um, or other organizations that you love uh, may also be on there. But Willpower also has a bunch of resources, like I said, about um, some talking points about putting a gift in your will um, and also some, some frequently asked question type documents, uh, which you may find useful. Our will workbook, a guide to planning your estate is on there. You can buy that or you can you can get that through uh, UCRD, UCRD, UCRDstore.ca. Um, uh, and that is a wonderful resource. We have a, a, a PDF copy of it on the foundation website, unitedchurchfoundation.ca. But if you want the physical copy, get it from UCRD. We have a picture of our legacy giving brochure on there. Um, you can download that again from our website. Um, that kind of is just something to give a high level overview of the things that we talked about here, what a plan gift is, the kind of impact that it can make and the ways that you can make a plan gift. Um, um, and then I have a picture of, of the loaves and fishes on there. That is to signify uh, the foundation's case for support document. Um, um, our case for support is called uh, loaves and fish. Uh, um, and you can find it on our website. Um, and it, it may inspire you to make a gift to the foundation, to learn more about giving through the foundation, um, and also inspire um, your own cases of support, um, if that's something that um, you are a part of creating. Um, if that might be a helpful doc document for you as well. Um, so there's those for you. But like I said, the te testimony is a very important part of it. So the resources that are going to be the most important um, to, to inspiring gifts in your community of faith are personal testimonies. Um, so we are delighted to be uh, joined by Susan Marrier, who is a uh, very generous, longtime friend of the foundation, careful steward for all of her life. And she is um, going to share a little bit of her story about how she gives um, and why she gives that way. So I'm gonna throw it over to Susan for a, a, a quick little story about that. Susan, if you're ready. I am. Okay, thanks Jess and, and thanks Melody for um, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I, I would first like to say that um, the, the materials that you have mentioned the modules and the, the training that is available for congregations, I would highly recommend them. Uh, I attended um, one of the courses uh, along with a, I call it, <clears throat> excuse me, a colleague from my congregation, and I found them really, really helpful. The one thing I would say that I, that I would emphasize that you both mentioned, it's really important for the um, clergy and for the leadership to be on board. Uh, otherwise, uh, and I speak uh, from experience with this, but um, uh, if they're on board, you can do wonderful things, I'm sure. So I come to you from Thunder Bay, uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, I'm a, a member of uh, St. Paul's United Church, and I'm uh, speaking to you from the, um, 
the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Fort William First Nation. And we are working very hard in our congregation to, in our community of faith, to reach out and to build relationships with the, um, the members of that community uh, that are nearby here. So I came to, um, I came to Canada um, from the United States. It was a very different world in those days. Uh, and uh, I came here to be the music director at St. Paul's United Church back in the days when that was a really big thing. Uh, big choirs, womb to tomb, um, handbells and the whole, the whole bit. Uh, and I was there for 16, 17 years. And then I spent uh, 12 years uh, at Sudbury uh, at the um, St. Andrew's U United Church there uh, doing the same thing and then came back uh, to St. Paul's here. Uh, I'm, I've am i been involved in uh, Presbytery when that was a thing, uh, conference and, and now, and recently in the region. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, I was uh, part of the team that um, brought St. Paul's to becoming an affirming ministry. And I'm still uh, leading the, the, uh, the team that helps the congregation and the board to, to live into that. And uh, part of that is relationships with, uh, with the indigenous people um, and, and working towards um, uh, accessibility and everything else that allows people to be full members, full um, participants in our, in our church. Uh, as far as giving is concerned, I, I don't just remember how um, my late husband and I got uh, into the uh, to the foundation, but um, we have been and I have been giving through the foundation for some time, and find that it's a really win 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 um, operation. It makes it so easy to to give to to my community of faith, to give to mission and service, um, and to the other things that the foundation does, and this and um, I really am concerned about about many, many people across the world who are suffering from so many reasons, from, from war, from, uh, as you all are, I'm sure, uh, concerned. And so my givings um, are both, uh, in addition to the church, um, I'm able to give, as was touched on, I'm able to give through the foundation to other organizations that align with the church's values. And so, uh, I divide those givings into, into four parts, really. Um, local uh, charities that meet local needs, such as the Regional Food Distribution Association, and, and then also local organizations that have a long-term effect on climate, et cetera, such as the, um, uh, th the Thunder Bay Field Naturalists, which is very much active in, um, in buying up property and and saving it for for the future uh, and then um, why the wider world such as um, doctors without borders who uh, work to meet the needs of, of people who are suffering um, from tragedies or uh, around the world from famine and so on and then uh, the other one that I uh, support is the um, uh, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society which uh, also works to uh, buy up uh, land uh, for future. So, and, and it's just so easy to do this through the foundation. Uh, it, it just makes it, uh, it's a one-stop shopping. And so um, I found that really, really to be helpful. It, it's, it, it, it's a win for me. It's a win for those organizations. It's a win for the foundation, for the, the wider United Church mission and service. It's a win for my own community of faith. So um, I think that's what I was asked to, to tell you about, just how I give and, and why. And um, so I, that's my story and uh, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and um, in the question and answer, I'm, I'm open to any questions that anybody might have. So thank you again for this opportunity to share. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. We really appreciate you being here and sharing that. So, well, like Susan said, we're going to open it up to some questions. Um, I have some here that, that have rolled in. So I'm going to answer them um, while you have five minutes or so to um, ask some more. Quickly, I just want to say, yes, we are recording this and we'll, we'll share the recording. Um, thank you for asking that. 
Uh, Richard said, what about supporting United Church University chaplaincies? Yes. Any United Church ministry that is um, a registered charity um, can receive a gift um, any in any of these ways. Uh, whether you're talking about creating a um, an endowment fund or being able to receive um, gifts of uh, the proceeds from a gift of securities um, or or any other ways that we mentioned, um, as long as you're a registered charity or if you're associated with a registered charity and can receive the money um, from them, we can filter it through them. Then yes, uh, chaplaincies absolutely. Um, uh, Rosemary asked, what happens to the community of faith endowments when the community of faith no longer exists? Um, that depends on what is in the agreement. Um, it's it's important to put in the agreement um, what you want to happen. Um, and it depends if it's a personal endowment or if it's one that the community of faith, the congregation has created um, as a congregation. Um, depending on uh, which region you're in, there may be specific rules about um, how your assets get <clears throat> kind of broken up um, after you close. Um, generally, it's just going to stay in the in the foundation. Um, but if it's a personal endowment and it closes, it's important to have um, um, a sort of backup plan in there to say if my community of faith no longer exists or if it's impractical, impractical to forward this money to them for the purpose that we've specified. Um, you can give here, 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 or it can go to mission and service. Um, or if, if you're amalgamating, then it can go to the successors or whatever you're assigning your, your assets to. Um, that And that can all be worked out um, in the agreement. And I should mention that the agreements are very flexible and you can continue to change them. Um, as your priorities or the priorities of your community of faith um, evolve. Um, so I, I encourage you if you have if you have questions about making them to to get in touch and we can talk about specifics about what happens um, at different stages of the life cycle of a of a congregation. Um, we also had a question: Does the estate get a tax credit for a charitable donation? Yes. Um, the only case when they wouldn't get a, a tax credit is if it's something that um, is falls outside of the estate. So if you if if you create a charitable gift annuity, if you want to know more about them, please uh, let me know. But if you have a, a charitable gift annuity, that's a planned gift that's outside of your estate. You get the charitable receipt when you make the gift um, while you're alive. Um, or if you um, give a gift of life insurance, um, that you're still paying premiums on and you donate the policy to the church, you receive a tax receipt each year that you pay the premiums and you, you don't get a tax receipt at the end for the benefit, uh, the, the death benefit that comes to the church. You just get the, the tax receipts during your life. Um, but if you have a whole policy that you name your church or the foundation or whatever ministry as the beneficiary of, then yes, your estate will get a tax receipt for the full amount. Hope that answers your question there. Um, are there others? I'd like to wrap it up, but let me see. What's the benefit of donating to a community of faith through the foundation rather than directly? Um, well, there's there's two ways. Um, if you're donating securities to benefit your community of faith, um, as I said, you don't pay the capital gains tax by donating your securities. Um, and doing that through the foundation, maybe because um, your community of faith is not set up to receive them, doesn't have the, um, the all, all of the ad administrative pieces in place to accept those kinds of gifts. Whereas we receive hundreds of them per year, and it's a it's a fairly well oiled machine uh, for processing those kinds of gifts and forwarding them on. If it's donating to a community of faith through the foundation. Um, in terms of setting up an endowment, of course, the benefits are, are sort of um, self-explanatory there, but that it will continue to provide regular um, support for your community of faith. Um, uh, do I have a tape presentation about types of playing gifts presented to be at a worship service? This is something that came out of 
um, the the recently wrapped up uh, module three program they were talking about. People want to have something that they can just press play on. So um, stay tuned, that will be coming. Um, I think I've answered them all. Um, so yes, Ashley has put a bunch of links um, in the chat there for all the resources. We of course will follow up with all of the links as well and our contact information when we send you the recording of this presentation. Um, you're welcome to share the presentation with, with uh, other members of your church and other leadership in your church um, or whoever you want. It's also going to be on the United Church YouTube channel and we'll point you to the links. Um, so if there are no other questions, Melody, did you have anything that you wanted to add here at the end? I just want to say thank you. It's amazing to see so many folks. Uh, uh, I see some familiar faces and some new to me faces. Uh, to me, it just um, is such a really key indicator um, and such a, a vote of confidence um, and hope in, in our ministries and the ministries that we love and the ways that we serve in the world. I'm so grateful for, for people uh, to take the time today to join us. Yes, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, whatever capacity you are coming to us in today, we're grateful for your, your participation in this and we hope you take something away from this, um, whether it's being inspired yourself or going out to inspire others. Um, thank you for being here. Please contact us with your questions and we hope to see you at a future uh, webinar. Um, stay tuned. Thanks everybody. <laughs>